content to be where the light and darkness meet on the edge of the horizon through the trees. I am a narcissist crippled with self doubt. I've got a courage that brings me to my knees. Hello, hi, and howdy. How is everyone doing today? I truly hope everyone is doing well. If you're new here, welcome. Um, if you're a return visitor, as always, welcome back. If you get anything out of the content, please take a moment to like and subscribe and send me a comment. Today's story is a suggestion from Laura Sheenan. And Laura, if you're watching, thank you so much for the suggestion. I'm going to warn you all that this is a very graphic story. Um, I just want you to go into that already knowing that. I also want to point out that most of the information in this story will come from a findings of inquest. Let's jump in. Mason Jet Lee was born on the 16th of August in 2014. He was the fifth child of Anna Marie Louise Lee. I'm not sure if Mason's father was involved, as I never found mention of his father. But about a year after Mason was born, Anna Marie met and began a relationship with William Andrew O'Sullivan. In many articles, William was called Mason's stepfather, but I see no record of William and Anna Marie getting married, and they did not live together, so I think personally that it was just the mom's boyfriend. Though the couple did not reside together, they only lived a kilometer apart in North Cabulture, Queensland, just north of Brisbane, which is in Australia. And for reference for my U.S. viewers, one kilometer is equal to 0 0.621371 miles, so just over half of a mile. William O'Sullivan was known to be a very jealous and dangerous man, and he had problems with various substances. When he and his wife separated, and to be clear, Anna Marie was not his wife, William threatened to skin his wife and unalive his children. When William met Anna Marie, he was living with his five-year-old son. Anna Marie Louise Lee also had a history. She had been known to the Child Safety Department since before Mason's birth in 2014. Mason's family had taken their concerns to child protection, including abuse and neglect. Anna Marie's sister, Chantel, said it was a very hard decision to report her sister but she was left with no choice as the children were living in pure filth. And Chantel, if you see this, um, you did the right thing. And it's too bad that child services ignored your cries and Mason's cries for help. Chantel said she was worried about Mason's welfare. In the inquest, it said, quote, It seems that it was the events happening with the family that was the driving actions by workers rather than the department reaching a conclusion about that that was going on and what needed to be done in a holistic way." Unquote. The panel agreed that there should have been more proactive information gathering around the suspected abuse or medical neglect of Mason, and they also noted that Mason was not seen by child safety workers at key times. They said that he was not with his mother when the staff were having their contact with her, despite the fact he was the youngest and the most vulnerable child in the family. On the 12th of February in 2016, Anna Marie called the National Home Doctor Service because Mason had a fever and a swollen leg. A doctor went to the home and after seeing Mason, called an ambulance to take him to the hospital. He was taken to the emergency department at the Cabulter Hospital. He was found to have cellulitis from an undiagnosed and untreated spinal fracture to the tibia. On the 13th of February, he was transferred to the Lady Salento Children's Hospital, where he spent 22 days. The medical issues treated during this 22 days was severe right leg cellulitis, severe perianal fissures, with ulcerated skin involvement requiring extensive surgical and medical management, anemia requiring a blood transfusion, mouth ulcers, and a healing spinal fracture of the shin bone. The experienced pediatrician said that the anal injuries were the worst he had seen in 40 years. The injury required a rectal stent. He was also diagnosed with severe erosive jaquets dermatitis, the primary cause is irritation of the perennial skin by feces and urine, 
which can occur due to infrequent diaper changes. Despite this, Child Services chose to return Mason to his mother. Between March and the beginning of June in 2016, Mason should have been seen by child safety officers 12 times. Instead, they only saw Mason one time for about five minutes. The inquest further found that if anyone from the department had seen Mason in the weeks prior to his unaliving, he could have been saved. In fact, in the inquest, Miss Bentley said, it was difficult to find any steps that complied with the department's policies and procedures or were properly documented. On the 10th of June in 2016, a neighbor to William O'Sullivan told a child safety officer that Mason was being held hostage by William, but the employee took no action. He went home as it was time for him to get off work. What? William had taken Mason from Anna Marie and was keeping him away from her at his home, and apparently she didn't bother to report her boyfriend, who was violent and dangerous, was keeping her son away from her. By this time, living in the home with William was his five-year-old son, a 17-year-old housemate named Ryan Hodson, who had only moved in about a week prior, and Ryan's girlfriend, Sheila, who didn't actually live in the home, but was there most of the time. Sheila said that she met William and Anna Marie, along with Anna Marie's children, including Mason, in the end of May. She met them at Anna Marie's house one evening. William told Anna Marie that he was going home and he was taking Mason with him. Sheila said that Anna Marie did not seem concerned about this. She said that she thought Mason was too quiet for his age, as he was not talking and he wasn't interacting with anyone. She drove them back to William's home and noticed that Mason had a really bad diaper rash. She said it was nothing like she had ever seen before. She said it went down to almost his knees. She said it was red, raw, and it was weeping blood. She told William she would take off Mason's diaper and put underpants on him with a pad on his bottom and told William to get some rash cream to apply. She said she was shocked at the state of his legs and didn't even know how he was walking around. A couple of days later, Sheila visited William's home once again. She said that Mason was still there. He was sleeping on William's bed. He woke up and started walking around the house. He seemed fine to her at that point, and she saw that his diaper rash was no longer bleeding, but that it was still red, and he still had cracked skin. His diaper was full and hanging down to his knees. She said the next time she saw Mason, he walked into William's room, and William went in and shut the door. Sheila said that Ryan told her that Mason wakes up in the middle of the night, and William takes him into the shower and that Ryan can hear him crying while he's in the shower, and they both found this behavior strange, but they did not report it. William installed a CCTV system in his home. Around 12.30 p.m. on the 6th of June in 2016, Mason is heard crying on the footage. Ryan is then heard saying, Oh, shut up or I'll hit you in the effing head. Mason continued to cry. Not long after this, he is heard screaming, and it is believed that this is when William struck him forcefully in the abdomen. The blow perforated his duodenum and tore the proximal jejunal mesentery. These injuries caused chemical peritonitis followed by bacterial peritonitis and septic anemia. Mason is heard on the footage crying off and on for the rest of the day. At around 6 o'clock p.m., William is heard yelling at Mason. By 9 a.m. on the morning of the 7th of June, Mason is heard vomiting. A friend of Anna Marie saw Mason in the back of William's car at the school drop-off later that morning. He said that Mason looked really white and didn't look well. About midday that day, a police officer saw Mason with William and Anna Marie at a local shopping center. He said that Mason looked unwell. Mason was crying, and Anna Marie was trying to calm him down. Mason had an appointment to see a doctor at the hospital on that same day, and though they went out shopping, they didn't take him to his appointment. 
William and Anna Marie got back to William's home and got into an argument. Anna Marie left, but again left Mason with William. Anna Marie returned to William's home at 7.59 that evening. She asked to take Mason home with her, so she asked a man that she knew was abusing her son if she could take her son home. She told him she'd call the law, but she didn't. William said that he would return Mason the following morning. About 9 p.m. that night, Anna Marie knocked on her neighbor's door and said that one of her children had dropped a shopping bag on their driveway and there was broken glass. The neighbors went out to sweep it up. Anna Marie told them while she was out there with them that if she was found unalive, just know that William did it. She told them that he had Mason and was refusing to give him back, and she said that he knew she wouldn't leave as long as he had Mason. She said that he was high on ice and had a machete, and if she left, he said he would unalive Mason and then come for her. They offered to call the law, but Anna Marie begged them not to. She said that if the police did not detain William, he would come and unalive them all. The neighbors then offered to call Child Services, and she agreed. They sent an email to Child Services requesting a call. They also called the Domestic Violence Service and spoke with someone who gave her advice. Sheila went to William's house about 3.30 p.m. on the 8th of June in 2016. She said Mason was in the bedroom with William. Child Services went to William's home on the 8th but did not see Mason. At 8 o'clock p.m. that night, Sheila went to William's home. She said that Mason was in the bedroom again with William. William told Sheila that Mason had vomited all over the floor. He said that Mason had been vomiting for about four days. When Sheila saw Mason, she said there was vomit all over him and even in his eyes. William told Sheila that he needed to learn not to vomit on the floor, so, so William rubbed Mason's face in it. He said he will learn. She said Mason appeared pale and dehydrated. She said that his eyes were dark and that he was just staring blankly. She told William that Mason needed to go to the hospital, and she said William replied, quote, I'm over the effing C-U-N-T spewing. Sheila had an argument with Ryan about taking Mason to the hospital and threatened to call the police. Ryan told her to shut up or William would bash the both of them. So you leave a 22-month-old to suffer? <sighs> Sheila returned to the residence the following day on the 9th of June, but she said she did not go inside. She could hear Mason crying even though he was inside and she was outside. She saw William and Anna Marie arrive at the residence. She had a conversation with Anna Marie, and Anna Marie told her that she wanted to leave William, but she was scared and no one was there to help her. She said that he had threatened to unalive Mason. She said she would call the law, but she didn't want to be a dog. And I wonder if that's the same thing as like over here in America, we call a rat. But Sheila said she then left the residence once again and didn't call anybody. A friend of William's stopped by for a visit. He saw Mason and said that Mason was very pale and had a temperature. He said that he told William that he needed to take Mason to the hospital, and he gave him some children's medicine for Mason. That day, Anna Marie met with two child service officers at the medical center. She told them that William was very violent and was smoking ice. She told them she wants out of the relationship. I wonder if at any point she thought that maybe Mason wanted out of that relationship. Maybe Mason wanted to be safe. That is so infuriating to me, but... but. About 2 p.m. that day, William picked up Anna Marie from her home. He had Mason with him. They went to William's house. Anna Marie and Ryan helped William clean up his home. Anna Marie must have known that Mason was unwell. Um, Anna Marie left William's home about 5 p.m. She took William's child with her, but once again, she left Mason. Sheila returned to the house around 7 p.m., she said the house was in a terrible state, that there were dirty dishes and moldy food everywhere. 
There was also dog feces on the floor and on the walls. William told Sheila that Mason was still vomiting. He told Sheila that he again rubbed his face in it as he had to teach him not to do it. And you are not going to teach a child or an adult not to vomit. It's not a choice. Sheila also said that Mason had a scratch on the side of his neck that looked like he had been grabbed. Sheila also noticed red marks on his arms and ribs and bruises on his legs. She asked William what caused these marks. He told her that Mason marked easily and he then pinched Mason's stomach to show her. Mason did not react at all when he was pinched. Sheila said that she told William again that if he didn't take Mason to the hospital, she would. She again left the house, leaving Mason there. And Sheila, if you're watching this, please let me know why you didn't seek help, because clearly you knew something was off. But about 9 p.m. that night, William and Anna Marie began texting back and forth. The first text was Anna Marie asking what Mason was doing. He replied he was nearly sleeping, and from there and into the early morning hours, they just exchanged texts about their relationship. About 8.15 in the morning on the 10th, Anna Marie asked William to get groceries for school lunches. He did, and then he spent the morning at Anna Marie's house. He left Mason at his house, however. Sheila went to William's house that morning. She said that she heard Mason crying inside, Her boyfriend, Ryan, told her that William had left Mason at home. Ryan said that William had locked him inside so he couldn't get out. Sheila and Ryan had a conversation through the front door. She left at around 10.30 a.m., but she still did not call for help. At what time does, should an adult say, screw this jackass and call for help? But around 12.15, Anna Marie texted William and asked him to have lunch with her. He answered about 1 o'clock, saying that he was changing Mason's diaper and that he would come over after. He went to Anna Marie's again and left Mason at his home. At 9.17, per the CCTV footage, Ryan left William's home. He said he was leaving and he saw Mason laying on the floor in William's room. He was wrapped in a towel and his lips were blue. He was making grunting sounds. But again, Ryan did not call for help. And God, this is infuriating. He said William was sleeping in the bed at this time. If William was sleeping and he was leaving, couldn't he have picked up Mason and walked out the door with him and called for help? At 10.09 p.m., William left his house without Mason again. He went to Anna Marie's house. He was very angry and looking for Ryan, who he believed was with Anna Marie. She said she had never seen William this angry, and he was threatening to get a shotgun to unalive her and Ryan. But here's my question. If Ryan had left the home and William was there with Mason, when William left to go to Anna Marie's, who was with Mason? At 10.16, Anna Marie phoned Ryan, but Sheila answered. Sheila told Anna Marie that Mason was not well. Um, Anna Marie asked her to go pick up Mason, but Sheila refused to and said she was caring for her own children and told Anna Marie she needs to be calling the police. And while I don't disagree, she could have went and got that baby. Anna Marie refused and said, quote, I'm no dog. Last time I told Will I was leaving, he said he would unalive Mason. Sheila then asked Anna Marie why William takes Mason into the shower with him. Anna Marie said he did this at her house also and that she heard Mason screaming. She said she tried to get in, but the door was locked. Anna Marie then told Sheila she would get Mason back the next day. Sheila agreed to meet Anna Marie at Williams and make him give Mason back. And again, no one thought to call the law or bust a door down or nothing. At 10.50, William arrived back at his home, and at 10.56, he texted a photo of Mason to Anna Marie sleeping on his stomach on a bed in a blue outfit with vomit all over the bed. There was a puppy laying on the bed with his head across Mason's neck. At 11.32 p.m., William's friend arrived at his house, and they were talking in the kitchen. At 12.16 a.m. on the 11th of June, William went into his bedroom. He came out of the room about 20 minutes later, and Mason was in his arms, and he told his friend, Help me. 
At 12.50 a.m. on the 11th of June in 2016, Queensland Police and paramedics of the Queensland Police Service were called to William Andrew O'Sullivan's home by the friend that was visiting William. When they arrived, William ran into the front yard holding Mason. He passed Mason over the front of the fence, as the fence was locked, to the paramedics on the other side. It was clear to the paramedics that Mason was no longer alive and had been deceased for some time. The paramedics and the police officers noticed immediately that there were bruises on Mason's face, arms, legs, and body, as well as severe injuries to his anal area. He was only wearing a diaper at this time. William told the police that he had fed Mason when he got home that night, and he said that immediately Mason vomited all over and that he cleaned it up. A few minutes later, William said that a friend of his arrived. He said later he removed Mason's nappy, which we call a diaper in the U.S., and gave him a bottle. He said after giving Mason a bottle, he and his friend were sitting in the kitchen and heard a coughing noise and saw that Mason's lips were clamped onto the bottle and they were blue. He said he phoned triple zero and commenced CPR, at which time Mason began to blow up like a balloon. He said that he then forced his fingers into Mason's anal area in an attempt to release the air in his stomach. And this was how he claimed he received the visible injuries to that area. He then began giving different accounts of what had happened that night. Mason was pronounced dead at the scene. Queensland police said that William had went in and out of his room several times during Mason's last hours and just left him on the floor in pain and misery. William showed no remorse and blamed Mason's 11-year-old sister for causing the injuries. He told the police that she was evil. He also tried to blame the paramedics for taking too long to arrive and said that the doctors and Anna Marie were negligent. He then tried to tell them that Mason had not been sick and it was obvious this was not true. William had not only inflicted these injuries in the days prior to Mason losing his life, but he had been in pain and extremely sick from these injuries for a period of time that William, Anna Marie, Sheila, and Ryan could have seeked help. And had child services responded to the calls, he could have been saved. Mason's little body was sent for an autopsy and an investigation began immediately. The autopsy was performed on the 14th of June in 2016 by a forensic pathologist, and the report was peer-reviewed by a senior forensic pathologist. The autopsy also included a CT scan, which was conducted by a consultant pediatric radiologist and a full toxicology. An autopsy revealed that Mason was in the 50% for his age in relation to height and weight, and had no underlying medical conditions which contributed to the It also revealed that Mason had been severely mistreated for some time. The toxicology report revealed that Mason was positive for substances, meth, and amphetamines. The injuries that Mason had suffered listed a rash on his face and around his face, weeping lesion under his eye, three mouth ulcers, one ulcer in his ear, five anal fissures, the most severe being 24 millimeters long and 4 millimeters deep, a partially prolapsed rectum, a total of 46 separate bruises to his body, two on his head, 12 on his trunk, four on his buttocks, one on his forearm, 18 on his left leg, nine on his right leg, and an old fracture of his left tibia, Six internal hemorrhages on his scalp determined to be from his hair being pulled. Injuries listed as severe to his abdominal and pelvic cavity were a tear in his small bowel behind his belly button, a ragged laceration of the small bowel mesentery overlying horizontal portion of duodenum, which is necrotic, with 10 millimeter full thickness perforation. If I said that I'm wrong, I'm not a doctor. 
hemorrhages within the soft tissue posterior to his duodenum and within the pancreatic tissue. His large bowel was collapsed. Focal hemorrhage within the subcutaneous tissue of the area of his rectum overlying his sacrum and coccyx, anterior displacement of his coccyx, a fracture of the coccyx which occurred more than several days prior to his passing. <sighs> Due to the injuries consisting of inflammation and perforation of the small intestine and surrounding tissue as well as a laceration of the supporting structures of the bowel at a separate site. Due to these injuries, fecal contents escape from Mason's bowel into the adjacent abdominal cavity resulting in infection which progressed to his bloodstream and he was sepsis, which is what led to him losing his life. The injuries were caused by blunt force trauma which could have been by squeezing or impact such as, per the pathologist, Impact such as seen in a high-velocity motor vehicle collision or by a fall onto a focal point. Both of the abdominal injuries could have been caused by a single blow or by two separate incidences of trauma. The coccyx fracture was caused by a separate blunt force trauma of moderate to severe force such as a punch or a kick. That injury was inflicted on Mason several days prior to his passing. The pathologist could not ascertain the cause of the anal fissures, but they were not recent. From the time Mason received the abdominal injuries until he passed, the pathologist said Mason was in severe pain, feeling extremely unwell and experiencing altered levels of consciousness. William O'Sullivan was charged with Mason's unaliving and cruelty to Mason between the 23rd of December in 2015 and the 13th of February in 2016. William contested the charges when the indictment was presented on the 18th of May in 2018 as William did not accept that he caused these injuries. He was, however, sentenced on the 28th of August in 2018 and he said that he was guilty but he didn't remember injuring Mason. He said that he was severely affected by addiction to the substances he was taking. When he was sentenced, he said that he loved Mason and he was remorseful. Now, I realize the laws are different in Australia than in the U.S., but Williams was only sentenced to nine years by Her Honor Chief Justice Holmes with 12 months for cruelty offense to run concurrent. She also declined to list William as a violent offender, but ordered he serve six years before parole eligibility. The Crown appealed the sentence on the basis it was inadequate. The Court of Appeal allowed the appeal and substituted a sentence of 12 years. Ryan Robert Barry Hodson was also arrested on the charge of unaliving Mason and cruelty to a child. When he was arrested, Sheila spoke out and said that her boyfriend did nothing wrong. He was expected to plead guilty to one count of cruelty to a child in the Queensland Supreme Court in Brisbane, but Justice David Jackson said he was concerned pursuing the charge against Mr. Hobson would set a potentially dangerous precedent for other teenagers or siblings living in a home with a child who was harmed. He raised a number of concerns over legal elements of the offense, specifically that Mr. Hobson was never in lawful care or charge of Mason Lee, despite being left alone with the child three times on the very day he passed away. Prosecutor Vicki Lowry tried to argue that Mr. Hobson was an adult and was capable of alerting authorities about Mason's condition. Justice Jackson, however, said that Ryan is not an adult he is another child living in the house. Justice Jackson further quoted, You could easily say he's uncaring. You could say that he is irresponsible, and you can say in some respects his speech indicated he responded in a nasty manner. But it is not being said that he physically in any way hurt this child or in the circumstances assumed any responsibility to it. He discharged Ryan Hodson and told him he is free to clear the dock. After crying on television every chance she got that she had been wronged and she wanted justice for Mason, 
Anna Marie Lee was charged with unaliving on the basis that she had failed to provide Mason with medical treatment. She told the police it was the fault of the department who hadn't done their job. She said she didn't know what to do to get medical treatment for Mason, which really, she had five kids. The case against her was based on her failure to remove Mason from the care of William. She failed to call the authorities knowing that William's treatment of Mason had resulted in his hospitalization. The court said that Anna Marie could have called the police when she knew that Mason had received a fatal abdominal injury and that he was gravely ill. Yet, she did nothing. She admitted that on the 9th of June, when she changed Mason's diapers, they were full of blood. She still did nothing. She told the police that during the relationship with William that he made her feel like a failure as a mother, and he took Mason and would refuse to allow her to change his diapers or to bathe him. She said that he did whatever he wanted to do with Mason, and that in itself should have been a problem. She told them that during the time Mason was hospitalized, she wasn't even allowed to visit him as William thought she would sleep with someone at the hospital. And I have said this before and I'll say it again. When you meet a man, quit letting that man control your child. A psychiatrist testified that Anna Marie was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and a mood disorder. She thought his control over her and her children was normal. In my personal opinion, I call bullshit. She was telling everyone that would listen that Mason was being mistreated and that Mason was very ill. The only people that she did not bother to tell were those that could have helped. On the 20th of February in 2019, her Honor, Justice Dalton, sentenced Anna Marie Lee to nine years imprisonment for the unaliving and concurrent three and a half years for cruelty. She gave her 936 days, time served, and set her parole eligibility at the 19th of July in 2019. The Crown again appealed, but the Court of Appeals stated, quote, A mother's grievous neglect of her child leading to the child's unaliving is an effort to community values, but an understanding of the reasons for the neglect lessens the sense of indignation that is felt. Miss Lee's personal circumstances as Mr. O'Sullivan's victim in an oppressive relationship and as the victim of her own upbringing operate heavily in mitigation of her moral culpability for Mason's unaliving. After spending less than five years behind bars for allowing the unaliving of 22-month-old Mason Jet Lee, Anna Marie was granted parole. The board imposed the standard conditions as well as numerous additional ones like curfew conditions for the first three months of her parole order. Needless to say, many people were outraged at not only the absurdly short sentences for such a crime, but the lack of response by child services. A spokesperson for child services stated that changes have been made to how reports are handled. And I'm baffled that it needs to be in guidelines that when abuse or neglect claims are made, the social workers need to see the children, as I would think that is common sense, but I don't make laws. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the tragic end of baby Mason Jet Lee's story. And as always, rest easy, rest easy, baby boy. You are not going to be forgotten and you are free. If you have not done so, and you get anything out of this content, please take a moment to like and subscribe. And um, if you'd like to be notified when I post content in the future, just hit that little notification bell right down there. And um, until the next video, toodles.